Hello and welcome, I'm Dave. Today we're going to build a REST API with Nest.js, an ORM, and a database. And I'll provide links to all resources in the description below. I'll also provide a link for you to join my Discord server where you can discuss web development with other students and you can ask questions that I can answer and receive help from other viewers too. I look forward to seeing you there. This tutorial is lesson five of a Nest.js series, and today's starting code is the completed source code from lesson four. If you haven't watched the previous lesson, there's a link to the playlist for this series in the video description, and I recommend you start at the beginning as each lesson will build on the ones before it. Today we'll be using Neon for our database. You can see it's a serverless Postgres, and it's very easy to work with, and there's good documentation. Likewise, we'll be using Prisma for the ORM. Now, I've had many many different requests for database technology and ORM technology as I've been building this series, and there's no way I can make everyone happy. However, I haven't used Neon or Prisma on my YouTube channel yet, and so that's what I'm going to create this tutorial with. Again, there is great documentation, and it will allow us to move forward quickly. Let's start on the neon.tech website today, and I'll have a link to this in the description, and you can see it right up here in the URL bar. And you want to sign up for a free account at Neon. Now, I'm going to sign in. I already have an account, and you should be able to do that with your GitHub account if you have one, for example. Now, you can see I have an example project in here called my example DB. You'll want to create a new project after you sign up, and you might have to verify your email address with Neon. I can't remember if I did that or not, but that's a good possibility. Okay, once you have a new project, we'll go into the project and you should see your dashboard. Now in the dashboard, you're going to have a database area here and you're going to want to create a new database. And you can see I have a database named Daves-ExampleDB. And then below that, there is a connection string. Now from here, we're going to choose the drop down menu and we can scroll and let's find, uh, let me see what I'm looking for here, Prisma, there we go. And once we find Prisma, also make sure your pooled connection is checked here. Once you have Prisma selected, and I'll scroll this up so you can see everything, we're going to use this code that's in here. It's saying put this code right here in the .env file, and then put this code, and we haven't created it yet, but in the schema.prisma file that's in the Prisma folder. And it allows you to copy all of this code. One thing to note, if you highlight and then control C to copy like this, you're going to get these asterisks in here that's hiding my unique value that they give me. That's a good thing that it's hiding that. I shouldn't see yours and you shouldn't see mine. However, you don't want to copy those asterisks. You want to copy the actual secret code that's underneath that. And you can show that by clicking the I icon right here, but you can also, without showing it, click copy, and it should copy the actual values that are underneath. So you might wanna do that now. Click copy and save this information in another file because we shouldn't need to come back to the Neon website until we're checking to see if we've actually saved data to our online database. So go ahead and copy that information and let's move on. And now we're back in VS Code. Let's go ahead and add Prisma to our project. We're going to do this at the terminal. So I'll press Control back tick, open up a terminal window, and here I'm going to type npm i Prisma dash capital D. That will add Prisma as a dev dependency in our project. When this is complete, we're going to initialize Prisma as well, and it will create a folder in our project with a couple of things we need. So here it's finished now. Now let's type npx prisma init and press enter. This will create the folder I was talking about and it should also create a .env file. Now you can see we have a message here with some instructions. I'm going to walk you through everything we need to do. You can read these of course if you want to. I'll go ahead and close that out. And now we see the .env file here. It's got some instructions in it. It's got an example database URL string. But remember from Neon, they gave us actually two strings we need. And that is true with Neon. We'll need that. One is a direct URL that we use in the terminal, essentially, is how we connect to our database. And the other, of course, is the database URL. And it also has to do with using pooled connections. So let's grab those. You should have saved those already when I mentioned that. But if you didn't, you can still get them here inside the uh, Neon dashboard. We need both of these, the database URL 
and the direct URL. Remember, if you copy them like I am, you're going to get the asterisks here, but you should use this copy icon down here, and then you'll get the values you need for your Neon account. So I'm just going to copy these, show you how I would put them inside of this .env file. I'm going to select the string that they have in here now and that value, then I'm going to control V to paste these others in. Also alt Z just to wrap everything down so we can see it. So we have two values that we want in the .env file. Now I'm going to put in my actual values, not the asterisks here, but I won't let you see those values of course because they're for my account. So go ahead and you should have these values in here with your values, not the asterisks. And now we're looking inside the Prisma folder that was created in our project, and we've got a file named schema.prisma. You can see in here we've got a generator client defined, and it has a provider value. Then we've got the data source DB that is here also. Now notice here we have URL equals that database URL value that we have in the ENV file. Now we need to put a little bit more in here and we can look back at the NEON website again where we can copy this information and see what we have here, data source DB provider URL and direct URL. We need all of that. So what I can do is just copy URL and direct URL and use both of these or we could just copy all of this, but then of course it copies what's above as well. So here's data source DB. I'll just copy the whole object. Now let's bring it back to our project. Make sure they're named the same as well. Yes, we've got data source DB here. It's got a provider and a URL. I'm just going to replace all of that, control V. Now we have direct URL here. We have the proper values everywhere and we're ready to move forward again. Now the next step, and you may not be seeing the color code here like I am already, I'm not for sure, but the next step is to make sure you do see the color code in the files we're working with. To do that, get the Prisma VS Code extension. I already have it installed, and so that's why my file was already color coded if yours wasn't. So go ahead and install this Prisma extension, and that way you'll see the color coding in the files like I am in the rest of this tutorial. Now that you've added that, we need to model data inside of our schema.prisma file. I'm in the Prisma docs and we're just looking at the quick start here and I've already got us started so we're on step two of the quick start in the docs. But this shows an example of the schema.prisma file here where they're modeling data. Now we're just going to have one model today but here's a really good example where they have a post that's related back to the user. We're not going to use a relation but you can see how that is shown here and you might want to learn more about creating models and you can do that in the Prisma docs. But I'm going to show you several things about the data with a model today. So I wanted you to see this example. Now let's go back to VS Code and set up our employee model. Back in VS Code, I'm going to scroll for just a little bit of room and we can define our model just below our database. So let's go ahead and say model, then employee. And now inside of this, we're going to have an ID now let's go ahead and use tabs here just to space everything over and maybe a couple of tabs. And then it's going to be type INT. And now we'll also say, I'll do two more tabs, give it an at ID. This will make it a unique ID. And you can see this here, defines a single field ID on the model. And that's what we want. Now also let's give this a default value. So now we use the at symbol and default and inside let's say auto increment. This would be typical that we have in a database. So as we add a new employee, it increments the ID one more value and moves forward. After that, let's go ahead and set up the name. And for the name, let's say, I'm doing space each time I want a tab. Let's say this is a string. I'll do another tab and we could make this unique, and then I may come back and change this just to show you how to change a model. But for now, we'll make it unique. Say email, that's also going to be a string, and we'll say it is also unique, as we would expect an email to be unique. Then we can give this a role, so our employees will have roles. Previously, we'd looked at a user example. Now we're setting up something new, but essentially the same type of data here. And we had a role enum at that point. We can define that as well. So I'm just going to set this as role and then we'll define that enum here in just a minute. On the next line, let's have created at. So we know when this record was created. So this would be a date time type. Now let's give this a default. And inside the default, we can just say now and call that 
and that will give it the current date time. Then we'll also have an updated at, which is also a date time. And now this is nice because you can just say at updated at, and this will actually insert the new value that where it was updated or the current date time. You don't have to pass in now or anything for updated at. Now we need to define our role here, which should be an enum. So underneath we can define role as an enum, and then it will just have our three values. Let's say intern, engineer, and admin. And now that we've defined the enum role here, we can use it up here in the employee model. With our data modeled, we're now ready to run a migration, which will actually create our employee table in our database at Neon. And I'll show you how that works. But first of all, let's talk about what we've got here. We've got employee, which essentially represents a table of data that we will have. So this is the data we expect to be in our table. And now when we run this migration, we're going to actually save the SQL, I usually say SQL, the SQL statements that are executed on our database. And we'll see those, and I'll show you the command to do that. And of course, it'll discuss a couple of options you could use as well. So let's open up a terminal window again, because we're going to run these at the command line. And so now that we have this, let's go ahead and type NPX, oh, let me use lowercase, NPX Prisma, and then I want migrate. Now here's the value that will be different depending on what you were doing. I'm going to type dev. This is going to save the SQL statements in a folder inside of our Prisma folder. You could instead type push. There we go, push. And that, of course, would do the same thing, except it won't save those SQL statements for you to reference later. I like having those saved to see what was executed on the database. Another option is deploy. If you were working with a local database first and then you wanted to send those changes to the online deployment, you would use that. Of course, we're not doing that. We're working directly with our online Postgres database at Neon. So I'm going to use dev here. Then you want dash dash name and then put init. This is your typical name for your first migration. So we're saying what the name of the migration is and I'm naming it init. I'm going to go ahead and press enter. We'll go ahead and let this execute. And then we should see some new things here in VS Code. Okay, I'm getting a message that it's going to change some things because I actually already had an employee table. You probably won't get this message as you would just be creating the table, but of course I worked through it earlier just to make sure I knew what I was doing. So I'll go ahead and say yes, and I'll let it make the changes to my employee table, and that's just fine. Now I have a migrations folder over here. You can see it's still running generate. We'll talk about everything that it's doing, but it saved those migrations that I was talking about. Now it ran generate, and after that it says it added two packages as well. So let's talk about what all this did. After we did that, it ran the migration, it created the SQL file, we don't need to look at the migration lock. There's nothing special in there. It just says don't edit this file. But here we have the date, time, and here is a migration.sql file where you can see these SQL statements that were actually executed on our employee table at Neon. So all of this happened. We created that employee table. And of course, it was noted that I was actually changing mine, but that's okay. It applied those changes for me. It created one for you. Now, after that, it also did something else. If we come back to the terminal and we see added two new packages, well, that's kind of like running an NPM install, right? That's essentially what happened because it added the Prisma client package to our project. If we look in here, here's scripts, let's look at dependencies, and now we have the Prisma client package, and we're going to be use that as well. Because it generated a tailored client API based on those models we defined back here in our schema.prisma. So now we have an API that we can reference types for as we use this model and as we use Prisma in our application. I'm going to open the terminal one more time. Let me see if I can find it. It says running generate. Yes, so anytime we change our model, we also need to run generate. And I purposely made the name unique because I'm going to change that. And I wanted you to be able to see how to do that as well. So now I'm going to remove unique from the name. We'll keep the email unique, but there might be more than one person named Dave or David or any typical name could have the John, for example. Somebody could be named John. Somebody else could be named John. 
So we don't want to make that one unique. So let's go ahead and apply a change to our model. And then let me show you what you have to do. Let's go ahead and open this back up. Now we want to type npx generate, or I'm sorry, npx prisma generate. And we'll go ahead and press enter now. And after that, we're going to have to run another migration just to execute those SQL commands. So we've got some more information here as well. That's fine. It did everything we wanted to with generate. And now after that, we need to go ahead and run another migration and we'll look at the SQL commands that are executed with this migration as well. So npx prisma migrate dev once again, dash dash name. Now I'll put a new name here and I'm just going to call this name change because we changed, changed the name so it's not unique anymore. I'll press enter, let it run this migration. And we'll, of course, since we chose the dev option, be able to see those SQL commands that were executed on our database. So as soon as this finishes, we'll take a look at those files. Okay, it's complete. Let's close this now. Notice we should have a second migration here that I hadn't opened yet. So now, here's the first one. Look at everything that happened here as it created the employee table, it created the enum, it put a unique index on the name and the email. But the second migration, all it needed to do was drop the index that was the employee name key because we no longer needed it to be unique. So it essentially evaluated what we had previously done and then it only executed the SQL, the SQL command that it needed to to update our data model with our database. So now everything's in sync between our application and our Neon Postgres database. We now have a Neon database and we've now integrated Prisma into our Nest.js project. So the next step is to create a database module and service. So I'm going to open the terminal window again and we'll use some commands we have previously learned. We'll say Nest G module database. Press enter. This should create a database folder in our source directory and there it is and inside we should have a module and we do we also need a service so let's say nest g service database and press enter and this should create our service file and of course it creates a testing file with it so now we have our new database files okay i'll close the terminal window and let's get to work on the database module so we have an import of module at the top and it's already imported our database service that's good we have our providers as a database service and then we have the export class database module that's good we also want an exports here as well so let's say exports and let's go ahead and pass in our database service that we have there and that's really all we need to add to this file now let's move on to the database service oh one other thing i want to discuss you may see this in some other tutorials where they add global up here you can do that that makes it available as long as you would import it into at least the app module you need to import your uh, database service into at least one as long as you do that then putting global here would make it available everywhere. Say if you had lots of different places you need to put that in, many connected modules, that might be easier, but it's not the best design choice. And we're in the Nest.js docs, just so you don't take my word for it on the global decorator that we'd see here, just like this at global symbol you see right there. And you can see how they use it here before a module. But as discussed, it says, Making everything global is not a good design decision. So it talks about when you might want to use it and when you might not. We're not going to use it today, but I wanted to bring it up because you might see it in some other tutorials. Just don't think you should use it everywhere. Okay, back in VS Code, let's look at our database service file. Here you can see it's very minimal as we start out. We've just brought in injectable as an import at the top. Let's also import on module init after we have that import we also need the prisma client now so let's import prisma client that's going to come from at prisma slash client okay we have both imports that we needed to add after that we just have export class database service well here we need to add to this it's going to extend so we'll use the keyword extends prisma client so we get those prisma types that we want to use 
And then it's going to use the keyword implements on module init. And after on module init, we have our curly braces. Let's go ahead and wrap this down with Alt Z so we can see that on the next line. Inside the curly braces, we need to say async on module init, which we'll call, and then it added an extra async for me. I can get rid of that. So just async on module init. And inside of that call, we're going to await this dot connect, and we need to call that connect. So that's why this is async. We await the connection to Prisma, and this is our database service. So remember that we're using the await here to connect. So later when you see our methods inside of our employees service, you won't see the await there. You'll see an async as we call this because we'll be calling Prisma, but here is where the await is as we await to connect. With our database module and service now created, we're now ready to start building our employees REST API. Now I've taken the previous lessons to talk about how to build modules, how to build controllers, how to build services, and we did those one at a time, much like we did the module and the service for our database here, but, what I'm going to show you now is how you can do all of that at once and create a REST API very quickly with Nest.js. So control back tick to open up the terminal once again, we're going to type nest g resource, and then what we want to name the resource. And this is going to be employees. I'll press enter and let's see what happens. It's going to ask us what we want to create here. What transport layer do you use? This is going to be a REST API. And then we'll say, or it says, would you like to generate CRUD entry points? And we will say, why? For yes, press enter. And now we can see an employees folder over here. Let's close the terminal, take a look at what's inside. You can see it created our controller, our module, and our service files, all created all of those already. We're not going to use the entities or the DTO file, although it did create them. And the reason we're not going to use those is because we'll be using the Prisma model that we already created and the types from Prisma. So I'll just delete both of those, but we do want these files for the controller, module, and service. Let's go to the module first. In the employees module, we need to go ahead and import our database module. So we will import, and after import, I shouldn't have pressed tab quite so quickly because we wanna put database module inside there. Okay, now that we have that imported, let's add it to our module here under imports, and we'll put our database module right inside, and of course, a comma afterwards. And that's all we need to change here inside of the employees module. So we've added our database module to it. Now let's look at the employees controller. And at the top of the employees controller, we deleted the DTOs. So we can delete both of those imports we had here from the DTOs that were automatically created. Now we need to import Prisma at the top. So we'll import Prisma and that comes from the Prisma client. So let's go ahead and just put from, and then we'll have at, Prisma slash client. And now here you can see we have this create employee DTO that's not being used. And we won't use that anymore. Instead, we will use the Prisma dot employee create input. And now that was created based on our model by Prisma when we did the migration and of course generated everything that linked Prisma to our database. So this is using a type now and we're using this instead of a DTO that we have created in a separate file. Other than that, we're referring to this create employee DTO essentially as the new employee here that is created. And you can see that it says return this dot employee service dot create. So we're going to want to have a create method inside of our service for this as well. But before we leave the controller, let's look at what else we have. You can see it started with the create here with a post method. So our CRUD acronyms, it just starts in order with the C for CRUD and that's a post where we're creating an employee. Then read, and there's two different read methods here with the git and one is to read all employees with the find all. The other is to find one employee. And that of course passes in a string. You can see it already added the unary plus here to the ID. So it's then a number that is passed in to the find one method that would be in the service. 
Now we have a patch and let me press Alt Z so that wraps down as well because the update employee DTO needs to be updated as well. This is once again going to be prisma.employee update and then we should have an input. There we go, update input. And that's what we want to use from Prisma here instead of the update employee DTO. But now of course this value once again is the updated employee that is passed. And you can see the unary is on the IDs here as well for both the patch and the delete because the ID comes in as a string. And this was all created for us very quickly. There's only one more change I want to make before we move on, and that is to the find all, because if you remember, we should be able to pass in a role so we only find all of the engineers or all of the interns with this as well. So let's do that by bringing in the query once again up here at the top. So that comes in from nest.js common, and now we can use that here. So we have our find all, I'll scroll up. So the find all is right here. Now, after the find all, we'll have at query inside of the parentheses. So at query and inside of there, we'll pass in a role value, not roles, just role. And after that, we'll say it's a role and it's optional. So we put a question mark and then a colon. And now our enum values, we'll have intern or an engineer or an admin. So right here, it is a TypeScript union type there where it could be any one of these. But then of course, later on in our model, it is an enum. And then after we get the role, if it's possibly passed in, we need to send in the role value. Now right now, we have a squiggly here because it's not defined at all inside of our service either. So let's save these changes and we'll move on to our service. And of course, this will be corrected as we define the find all inside of the service. So now we're at the service file, we can once again delete the DTOs that are imported at the top. And now let's import Prisma. And that's once again going to come from at Prisma slash client. And then we need to import the database service that we previously created. Okay, now that we have both of those, we need to go ahead and inject that database service here into our employee service so we can use it inside. And that's going to be with a constructor. Now inside the constructor, we're going to say private, read only. Then we say database service with a lowercase d, and then we reference our database service with the uppercase d. And now after that, we just need those empty squigglies and then it will be happy and we won't have any red squigglies underneath. So our empty curly braces, I should say right there. Now after that, we can once again refer to our Prisma employee create input here. So I'll delete the DTO and say this is prisma.employee create and then input, we see it there now. And so right now, let's not change the return action yet, but we are bringing in that input. And we're going to need to do the same down here with the updated. So let's do this while we're thinking about it. Prisma.employee updated or update input. There we go. So now we have changed out those types correctly. And now we're ready to adjust the rest of our methods. Now another change we need to add to each one of these methods that I did mention before with the database service is that they need to be async. Now our return will not be awaiting anything here. Remember that await is over inside of our database service. But of course to call that, to have the database service within, which we will, we need to make these methods async here. So let's go ahead and add async to the beginning of each one so I don't forget to do it at some point on any of those. So all of these methods will then be async inside of our employee service. And now let's go ahead and reference that database service inside. So we have injected the database service here. So we'll start with this dot database service, and then we'll say employee. So this references our employee model, and then we should have access to the Prisma types. So the Prisma methods like, I'll put a dot and we should have a create, and we do. Now inside of the create here, we're going to say data, then we're going to pass the create employee DTO that is defined right there. So it's that value. This is the new user. If you wanted to name that new user, 
you could, but this follows the standard pattern calling that in create employee DTO. Okay, after that, we'll come down to the find all. Remember the find all, all had possibly a role, but only possibly, it's not required. So we'll once again define it here as optional and we'll pass those same values. It could be intern or it could be engineer or it could be admin type. So any one of those could be the role. So now we shouldn't have a problem in our controller any longer and you can see I think it's happy now with the role being there. Back in the service now, let's go ahead and create the return type or find all. So here we're going to say this dot database service dot employee. And after that, we'll say find many. And now inside of our curly braces, we can stipulate, we can say where, and now pass in the role if that role exists. And if not, it should just return everything. Underneath this, this will have a return this dot database service, essentially the same thing, employee dot find many, and we're going to call that. So of course, now we need to logically say, right now, this is showing us with highlighting that only the top return would happen. So above, before we return that, we can say if role, now this only happens if a role is passed, and if not, it's going to return this line here. Okay, let's scroll just a little bit, and now let's change our find one return type. So find one is also going to start off with this dot database service dot employee, and now we're going to find unique. And inside of this unique, we'll go ahead and say where, and then we'll pass in the ID. And when you see me put in an ID like this with a comma, or a role with a comma, it's because the key has the same name. So it beats me doing ID, ID, which you could also do, but you don't have to do it when they have the same name. So I just have ID comma, same with role, instead of a key of role and then a value of role. So that's why you see it that way. Now after that, we need to go ahead and say we've found one, and well, I guess that's it for find one because it's going to return that right here. Let's move on to the next one now. And the update part here will say this.databaseService.employee. I think you see the pattern. Now we'll call update. And here we'll say where. This would be where we have that specific ID we've identified, but then what are we going to update? So now we'll have a comma. Now we'll pass in the new data, which is the update employee DTO. And now finally, we're ready for the delete. And of course it's named remove right here, which is fine. That was automatically created for us. I'm going to copy the find one above, control C for that. I will come down here and change this. And all I really need to change is the find unique it needs to be the delete method. So we're going to remove where the ID of course passed in matches. Now I might've named this delete myself, but they named it remove. And since we used that auto generation for our entire REST API, if we come back to the controller, we should see that same method here. So remove is already here in the controller as well, and everything matches up. So I think you can see how easy this was to create these service methods because we extended Prisma. And so that gave us those Prisma methods. We have our database service, then we reference our model, and then we had the Prisma methods there available with dot notation. Okay, we're ready to start up our REST API and check out a few endpoints. So let's go to control back tick, back to the terminal window. Now we can type npm run start colon dev, and this should start our REST API. And we can see everything's running. I'll have to scroll back up in the terminal, see if it tells us exactly where it's running, and no, it didn't. But of course we can reference that also if we look at our main TS, we'll close this out. See, we're listing on port 3000. Let's create a new request with Thunder Client here. So I'm going to click new request. And at the top, I'll be able to type localhost, and then it should be port 3000 slash employees, no slash at the end though, no space. Let's just say slash employees and send our request. And I may have an issue here with the HTTPS. It probably should just be HTTP in dev mode. Let's go ahead and send that. Yep, everything looks good. And we don't have any employees yet, but we do know our server is working. We just have an empty array and that's fine for now. 
So let's go ahead and go to the post request to complete a request and create a new user. So we need to go to the body here. And for the body, if you remember, we needed to add a name. So here we'll say Dave. And after that, we need an email. Here we'll say Dave at DaveGray.codes. And finally, we can say a role. And here I'm going to make Dave an admin. And we don't want that extra comma there when we send a request. But there is the full body of our request. It's going to be a post request to the employee's API. Let's go ahead and send this. And the information we get back says, yes, this was created. Here is Dave's ID. Here is that created at timestamp. And here is the updated at timestamp. So if we send another like request with an update, then of course we might get a different updated at value as well. But let's go ahead and create a second user first here. Let's say Ken. Let's start out with a capital K. And we'll give him Ken at DaveGray.codes. And Ken is an intern. So let's send this. And now Ken has been created as well. So we've got a couple of employees in the database now. So now after that, we can issue our get request again to employees to get all. And let's see if we get both back. Yes, here's an array of JSON data. Here's the first employee. Here is the second. So we've got both of those. Now let's just get one. If you remember, we can do that by passing in an ID at the very end of the URL. So pin is ID two. Let's see if we can get that with our find unique request here. And yep, we just got kin return. So that worked as well. Now after that, let's update one. So we do that with a patch request, bring this back down. And what we want to do is say update number two here. That's fine. Let's promote kin to an engineer. And let's go ahead and send this information now. And let's see what we've got. We scroll up here. We've got this information now. Ken has been promoted to an engineer. Notice the updated at time is now different than the created at because it went ahead and gave the new timestamp to when the record was updated. Now let's go ahead and do a delete. We'll go ahead and delete Ken. He's decided to leave the company now. And we're sending that to ID number two. So that should delete Ken and we'll send. We get his information back. But now when we request all users, we'll just say get, we'll get rid of the ID number at the end, send this. The only user left is Dave. So that worked as well. Now let's go ahead and post maybe a third employee. So give some more information here and we'll come in here instead of Ken. Let's go with, uh, let's say Gina. Let's say Gina at davegray.codes and she's an engineer as well. Send this information. New uh, user is created or new employee is created. And now if we go back and get all one more time here, we should get both Dave and Gina as employees. So everything is working as expected, all of those endpoints. And you can see how easy this was all to pull together with type safety by extending those Prisma types and we could access those methods. It all works very smooth and it created our Neon database, which we haven't even had to go back to the website to modify or do anything with. Let me go back there now and we'll look at our Neon database here so we can look at tables inside of this window and let's see what we've got for tables. Pulls up our employee table and we can see inside of the employee table here at Neon, we've got Dave and Gina as we entered them into our database. Very easy, very smooth, all type safe all the way through. I really like this developer experience and we created a complete REST API. But we're not quite finished with our Nest.js series yet. We'll be back to add a few extras to our REST API in the next lesson. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you. And thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.